Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, hey, welcome. Glad that you're here. If you're worshiping online with us, welcome. If you're at the Woodlands campus, shout out to the Woodlands campus, welcome. And if you're here in Center Court East or Center Court West, we're glad that you're here at Stubner Airline for our Klein campus services. Welcome today. So if you weren't here last week, let me sort of bring you up to date. We started a new five-part series last Sunday in which we're looking at several key portions from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. So where we uh, started in last week was talking about how this uh, boy, he was just really probably a teenager, was Daniel, was growing up in Israel about the time that King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians moved in and conquered Israel, knocked down the walls, torched the place, destroyed the temple, and carted off 10,000 of the brightest and the best young men to be exiled in Babylon. His strategy, you recall, was to Babylonize them, to try to dilute their Jewishness and have them forget about all of that in their past and turn them into bright, smart, functioning, high-achieving Babylonians. That was his strategy. So we talked last week about how young Daniel and his three friends went into that place because they had no choice And they applied themselves and they did their best while never forgetting who they were and whose they were. And God had his hand of blessing upon them and showed his favor uh, to them. And they rose like cream to the top and were the best among all the others. And they reflected this humility that we talked about and chose their battles well and so. And, And so that's where we left off last week. This week, we pick up in the beginning of chapter 2. So why don't you uh, open your Bibles to chapter 2 in Daniel. And if you need a Bible, I see the ushers are coming in the aisles in all of our rooms. You just wave your hand, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one. And if you need to keep one, it's our gift to you because we want you to have a Bible. So we'll go to chapter 2 in Daniel. Now, while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been the victim of a bad dream I'm I'm not talking about, have you ever had a bad dream? I'm talking about, have you been the victim of a bad dream? Or specifically, have you been the victim of somebody else's bad dream? I'll illustrate several times, particularly when we were uh, newlyweds, Suzanne would have this dream that I was marrying somebody else right in front of her very eyes. And she would wake up just fuming mad. And I'm waking up going, ah, what did I do? Because she had this dream. It seemed so real. And, and <clears throat> so I remember one time I had uh, risen early, as I typically do, and I was out in my study working. And, and uh, a little while later, she uh, awakened. And, and next thing I knew, she was standing there at the door of my study. And I looked up. I could tell by her countenance. Uh oh, something's wrong. What did I forget? What did I know? You know, and and I looked at her and said, "Good morning. Uh, how are we doing?" She said, "You got married to somebody else." And I said, "No, no, I did not get married to. I'm married to you. I love you. I'm committed to you. I have no other wives. I'm just in here working on my sermon for Sunday. It's a very helpless feeling when you're having a conversation with somebody about a dream that isn't real, right? You ever had that experience? I tell you that because I have a feeling that it's not a feeling unsimilar, dissimilar to that which was experienced by many of King Nebuchadnezzar's inner circle of wise men because Nebuchadnezzar had been having a dream, and it was a bad dream, and they're going to be the victims of his having a bad dream. Let's look at that. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he couldn't sleep. 
So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. And then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll interpret it. And the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and then interpret it, I'll have you cut into pieces and your house turned, houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and then interpret it for me. So you see the, the, the situation. The, the wise men are coming in and, and they're asked not just to interpret the dream, but to tell him what he'd dreamed. It wasn't because he'd forgotten their own. He knew what he'd dreamed and it was troubling to him and with good reason. But he's saying, look, I don't want, I, if I tell you the dream, I know what you're going to do. You're just going to open up those Babylonian manuals of dream interpretation, and you're going to say, oh, king, when you dream that you're free falling, here's what it means. Or if, if you dream that you forgot your final exam and slept through it, here's what it means. And, and here's what it means if you're walking around in your underwear, oh, king, in your dreams. And here's what it means if you're flying in your dreams, king. And all of these mean, he's like, I don't have time for that psycho babble. I got a real problem, and I need to talk to somebody who can really interpret for me what's going on. The only way I'm going to know to trust you is if you can tell me what I dreamed, and then you bring the interpretation. If not, I'm going to have you cut into little pieces. No pressure. Talk about your boss's dreams becoming your worst nightmare, right? So verse 7, once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream. And then we'll interpret it. And the king answered, I'm certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I've firmly decided. If you don't tell me the dream, there's only one penalty for you. You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I'll know that you can interpret it for me. Verse 10, the astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king However great might is ever ask such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. So what's going on here? Well, they're looking inside themselves and knowing we're bankrupt. We don't have inside of us what it's going to take to solve the problem of the king here. Well, they were right about that. And they were also right about saying, you know, only God could do this. What they were wrong about was saying, and he's not available. He doesn't traffic among us people. That's the part they had wrong. Verse 12, this, king, this, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Now, we don't know exactly where was Daniel and where were the friends and why were they a little separated off from them. We don't know exactly, but what we do know is they're going to find out soon enough about this edict. They're going to hear about it themselves, these star graduates from BU, Babylon University, who as we saw when we left off last Sunday, were, were, were star pupils. They, they had bright futures ahead of them, promising careers to serve the inner circle of the king. But then the knock comes at the door, and it's bad news. Bad news for you. It's over. You know, life can be like that, can't it? Fragile. One day things are going along, and it's just great. And then all of a sudden, a knock at the door or a phone call or a letter in the mail, and everything changes. Some of you have gotten a knock or a call or a letter like that, even maybe in the last month. So how do you respond when you get that kind of news? How do you respond when the doctor says, it's cancer? 
How do you respond when, you're, respond when your employer says, thank you so much for your years of service, today's your last day? How do you respond when the stock market drops precipitously? How do you respond when your spouse says, I want out? How do you respond when the police say, it's about your child? Uh, but this is where we're really tested. And all of us go through testing in life. No one's exempt. No one likes it. But sometimes God lets us come to the end of ourselves because it's only when we come to the end of ourselves that we can really see, we can really discover what we're relying upon. The only way for the genuineness of our faith to be confirmed is to be put through the fire of testing, the fire of desperation. It's only through hardships and trials and Desperation that the genuineness or the fraudulence of our faith is revealed. So just as the hot fire is necessary to burn off the dross or the waste in the process of refining gold, so it is in our lives that the fire is required to burn the dross off of us so that what we can see revealed, so that we can see what is genuine Revealed with clarity. Well, Daniel was facing a, a real test at this juncture. And they were at his door, and they're here to say, We've, you've got to come with us to your execution. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a bad day. Well, here, I want us to notice two things from chapter 2 today. Okay, so if you're a note taker, here, here are the two things I want to... because great things for us to learn and to benefit from um, as we're journeying forth in our own faith journey, learning from Daniel. The first one is, how did he respond emotionally? And the second one is, how did he respond spiritually? How did he respond emotionally? And how did he respond spiritually? Let's look at emotionally first. Verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Notice, with wisdom and tact. He didn't have a heart attack. He didn't have a panic attack. He didn't go on the attack. He responds with wisdom and tact. Now, you should circle those two words in your Bible, wisdom and tact. You may be using a, a version or a translation of the Bible that has some variant words, but they're close. That gets to the essence of it, wisdom and tact. What is wisdom? Wisdom is doing the right thing. It's doing the right thing. What is tact? Doing the right thing, saying the right thing at the right time, in the right way way. So what does Daniel do? He responds with this wisdom. He asks a reasonable question. Verse 15, he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And then he does something that we should always do when we ask a question. He listened. James 1.19 says we should be quicker to listen than we are to speak. Right, And so Arioch then explains the matter to Daniel, verse 16. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now, I want you to picture this scene. One commentator describes it so vividly. Here's King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the 20 most powerful rulers and wicked of all history. And he's seated on his throne and chained to each side of his throne is a lion. And it's just the quintessence of power. And into this throne room, Daniel is ushered. Now, we don't know exactly how that introduction was made, but I've had to imagine in my mind if perhaps Nebuchadnezzar looked down upon hearing the announcement that Daniel was coming before him to have him remember sort of vaguely, Daniel, I do remember you and your three friends. You were a cut of the above, above the rest of the 
graduating class a year or two or three ago. So what is it that brings you here? However it happened. We know that Daniel said, King, just give me some time and I'll get your answer for you. Something about his composure, something about his confidence, something about his countenance must have appealed to the king. Certainly he had his wisdom and tact working for him. That blending in with the workings of the spirit and the blessing of God that was upon him. However it was, the king said, okay, I will give you time. We suppose he, he probably didn't really want to kill all of his magi so much as he really wanted an answer. And so he says, okay, you can have some more time. Daniel responded with this wisdom and tact. We saw it last week. We're seeing it here. And God can work great things through that candy. So my question is to you right now, how do you respond in a crisis situation? How do you respond when you get some bad news? How do you respond when the knock on the door or the phone or the mail comes and it's, 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 it's bad news? How do you respond when your financial situation starts to crash? Or how do you respond when you get pulled over by a cop who says, you are speeding and I'm going to give you a ticket? How do you respond in that moment? Or how do you respond when something in life is irritating you or something in the news and it's, it's irritating you? Or do you just go on Facebook and just vent about it for the whole world? How do you respond? Do you respond with wisdom and tact? God works through that. How I've seen it time and time again. When I think of wisdom and tact, I think particularly of one of my dearest friends. Been a friend of mine for more than 25 years. His name's Daniel as well. You call him Pastor Dan Slagle. I can't number the times that when something's on my mind, it's bothering me, it's, uh, I'm feeling stressed or distressed or confused about something or perplexed or maybe it's my personal life or family situation or a church situation or a leadership situation where I've got, gone down to his office and sit down and I said, just let me talk and I just talk it all out and consistently all these years I've known him, he sits and he listens and he ponders and then he responds with wisdom and tact. Well, brother, have you thought about this? Or brother, what do you think the Lord might be trying to show you through this wisdom and tact? Sometimes I've asked myself, how would Dan respond in this situation. How are you doing with that wisdom in fact, That's the growth edge for me, to respond in crisis situations with wisdom in tech. But you know, I'll tell you something I've learned. It's not something you can conjure up from your insides. It's not something that you can sort of will into existence. Well, I'm just gonna try, try, I'm gonna try so much harder this time. This day I'm gonna get it right. I'm gonna respond to those kind of things with wisdom. It doesn't work that way. Because you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. None of us are good enough in and of them ourselves. We can't will that sort of response out of ourself. Neither could Daniel in the Bible. But there's one even better than Daniel, Jesus, who came and he always responded with wisdom and tact and grace and truth. And he makes himself available to us so that we might have relationship with him, so that he might live inside of us through the power of his Holy Spirit indwelling us. And once we realize that, and once we realize I could access, I can't will this into myself emotionally. It's not, I'm not good enough, but he is. And if I'll access through prayer, 
his benefits, the strength, the wisdom, the tact, the grace that he supplies, then it will come out of me. Do you know Jesus? Have you called upon him? Do you let him live inside of you, showing leadership and lordship in your life? It's the key to wisdom and tact. Well, the Daniel of the Bible, he clearly was guided by the Spirit of the Lord. He responded just perfectly emotionally. And that leads right into the second observation I wanted to make today from Daniel 2. And that is his spiritual response. What's he do? He's going to go directly to prayer. Let's look at it. Verse 17. So... Then then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matters to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember? He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now remember, at this stage, Daniel's probably 18, 19, 20 I mean, he's a young man, but notice this emotional and spiritual maturity that he is existing. When the the heat is on, when he's feeling the pressure, when the walls are closing in, the guards are standing there, say, come with us, we have to execute you now. He's, He's, he just got it right. He's responding emotionally and he's responding spiritually just the way we, we should. What's he doing? He's, he's going to God in prayer. He's going to call a prayer meeting. That's really what he's going to do. He's, he's getting his three friends. He's getting a small group. He's getting his grow group together and saying, hey, we need to pray. I, I can't do what I've told the king th- that I'll do for him. I, in and of myself, I'm not good enough. I don't have the resources within and I, you certainly don't want to go walking in and sort of wing it and make it up because the king knows what he's dreamed. I can't access this by myself. But there's a God in heaven who can do this. You get on your knees. I'm getting on my knees. We're going to wait before the Lord and we're going to let him speak to us. That's the only hope we have, that he's going to speak to us. He calls a prayer meeting. It, you know, by the way... <laughs> I've been asking myself, why is it that you and I are so slow to call on the Lord in prayer when moments of crisis occur in our lives? Yeah, I, so many of us, so often we, when a crisis situation occurs, you know, what do we do? We jump into, you know, well, okay, here's what we're going to do or trying to figure out how can I get myself out of this rather than just saying, okay, I'm going to go to God the creator of the universe, the Lord of all time, the king of all kings. I, I have access to him. I'm going to start there. So often I'm afraid what we do is we say, I'll just do everything. And if I run out of resources and still don't have the answer, and then I'll turn to God. You know, it's come to that. We might as well pray. And don't you know the Father in heaven's like, well, thank you so much for thinking so highly of me that you finally got down to me here, number 19 on the list. Instead of saying, you know what? We're going to start with you, God. We need you in this situation. Because if you won't, it won't. But if you would, it will. You know, I think we're so slow to, I think one of the reasons we're so slow to it is is to, to pray, that is. Is that we, we, I think we kind of convince ourselves, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's not going to do much good. And besides, God, I mean, he's so busy. Good heavens, just start over in the Middle East. You got Iraq, Iran, you got Syria, you got Israel. He's got all those big, big problems he's got to deal with. And then work yourself up to Europe, and you got the immigration refugee crisis going on there. He's got to work through that. And then you get over to this country, and oh, boy, there's all sorts of excitement, economic excitement, political excitement, 25 thousand candidates running for president you know and there's so many things to, you know, for him to deal with and <clears throat> and I think we just convince ourselves you know he's probably got bigger fish to fry 
And we shouldn't do that, but we do do that. And we forego what he's invited us to, to come into his throne room directly. What did Jesus say? Look at Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. So which of you, he says in verse 9, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? You wouldn't do that. If you then, though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, just imagine how much more the Father in heaven knows how to give good gifts to those who ask him. I was thinking about this passage just the past week. I, I think it was Monday or Tuesday night, I don't remember, and, and I was, I was uh, particularly, what do you know? Um, I was particularly uh, tired from a long day and had been, uh, you know, working and had meetings and all, all day. <clears throat> then I'd gone to the gym to do my cardio and got that done. And I got home and had dinner and the family and everything's going along fine. And I was sitting in my easy chair uh, doing some reading and relaxing and feeling good about the day and that I was done. And, and about that time, my littler guy came up. His name's William. And he said, Daddy, would you come outside and throw the football with me? And I said, normally I would, son. But, you know, it's just, it's been a long day and I'm tired and... I, I just, I think I got to take a pass today. I'm going to just sit inside and just read. He said, okay. And he walked away. Now, about 20 minutes later, he came back and he said, Daddy, would you come throw the football with me now? And <clears throat> I said, well, now, nah, son, again, not, not much has changed. You know, I'm, I'm still pretty pooped and I'm going to take a rain check uh, this time, okay? If you'll go ahead and just give me a pass this well, I could tell he was disappointed, but he said, okay, and he walked away. Well, about 20 or 25 minutes later, he came back and he said, Daddy, and as he started talking to me, he, he began climbing up into my lap, and he sort of slithered up into my lap in between where my book was and my face, and his face comes up right here so that now I can't see my book, but I can only see him, and he puts his hands up on my cheeks, and he says, Daddy, I need to tell you something, okay? He said, I've made a decision that I'm not going to get out of this chair until you come outside and play football with me. <laughs> well, I did what you're doing. I chuckled. I thought, that's pretty ingenious, and it's definitely persevering. And I said, all right, come on, let's go. And so I went outside, and we threw the football. And soon thereafter, I felt like the Lord said to me, that is the right posture for all of my children in prayer. For if you, fathers and mothers, if you're sinful and you know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It's the right posture. Daniel understood that. He said, we're going to God. And he's the only one really he, who can do this for us. And so we haven't any other choice. He got his three friends praying. Like I said, that's a grow group. By the way, if you haven't noticed, we talk a lot about grow groups around here, right? Last week we had the meet and greet and hundreds of you took part of that and started taking steps to get involved. And, and I just want to put the, 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 the thought out for you again. If you missed that or you weren't able to take advantage of that, if you're free floating around here, you sort of come in and you come out and you're not connected when crisis comes in your life, who's going to pray for you? Who's going to help you carry the burdens? When victory and rejoicing should be had, who are you going to share that with? See, God gives us the benefit of community. And so I encourage you, take advantage of it. Let's get you in a grow group. And um, if you miss that, just write on your Connect card. You can just say, you know what, I, I think I would be interested. And check the little thing, and, and that way we can give you a contact this week and, and see about helping you try to get plugged in so that you can um, have some people that win 
the going gets tough, you can say, I need some prayer. And there they are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were for Daniel. So Daniel and his three friends, they hold themselves up. They're praying, they're waiting. They know the character of God. They're saying, hey, God, we know you are good. We know you're loving. We know you're all powerful. We've seen you do it before. We have no question that you could do it again. And so we're just asking, would you do it again? If you won't, it won't. But if you will, it will. So have you ever been desperate yourself for an answer from the Lord? Just calling out saying, I, I, I'm desperate. I have to have an answer, Lord. I bet some of you are there right now. I was thinking my mind just carried me back to, to 17 years ago. I was in that situation. I was barreling towards the completion of my doctoral program. And it was March. And the program would end in June. So I had about eight or nine or ten weeks until we were going to run out of road, and, and then I was on my own. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I finished up with my doctorate. My colleagues, all 100% of them, they all knew where they were going. They all knew where they were moving. They all knew what they were going to do. And I didn't know. And it's not that I hadn't had some opportunities. I was, it was, there was one church that said, why don't you come be our pastor in Alabama, and another one in California, and another one in Calgary, Canada, Burr. But none of those felt like the right things. And so I said no to all of them. So I have nothing and the, tick, the, to, the, to, the clock is ticking, and the time is running out, and I'm saying, Lord, I, I got to know. And I remember I was on a trip and found myself in the hotel room, and I was by myself in, in the middle of the night and couldn't sleep. And, and I just said, Lord, would you please show me? I, I, I have to know. What is it that you're going to want me to do when I'm done? Time's running out. Nothing. Silence. So I asked again. Nothing. Silence. So about that time, I, I remember just lying back on the pillow and starting to close my eyes. And I just said, well, Lord... <laughs> Whenever you want to tell me whatever it is that you want me to do, I just want you to know I'm ready to hear it, and I'll do it. I'm all in. I'm signing the check. But you've got to write it in. And so I'll just be waiting. And I remember just about then closing my eyes and like that, I sense the spirit of the Lord say to my spirit, I'm going to call you to do a new work. And my eyes popped open. I was like, really? And that's all I got. But that was enough. That's all I needed. I'm going to call you to start a new church. And I remember everything inside of me changed at that point. And I, I, even though the details wouldn't be filled in for still some weeks, everything was different at that point because I knew that I knew I've met with the King of Kings and I've heard from him. There's nothing like it. What happened in Daniel's story? Let's continue on. Look at verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. He got it. God answered. God showed him. Here's the picture that Nebuchadnezzar's been seeing in his dreams. At which point, Daniel breaks into songs of praise. You just picture him doing this happy dance as, as he exclaims, look at verse 20. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. I 
thank and praise you, God, of my ancestors. You've given me the wisdom and power. You've made known to me what we asked of you. You've made known to us the dream of the king. Now, remember, the catalyst for this prayer meeting that he and the others were having was a death sentence, right? Has the execution been stayed? Nope. So what's different? Nothing objectively, but subjectively, inwardly. Everything is different at this point because he knew I have heard from the king of kings. I've met with the Lord. I have the answer, and that changes everything. And with that confidence, he walks back into the presence of the king and says to the king, I have the answer. I'm going to tell you now what you dreamed. And then I'm going to give you the interpretation. And that's exactly what he does. And the king's mouth is hanging open and he's thinking, surely you are ten times better than all the others. But Daniel, to his credit, he doesn't take the, 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 the glory. He doesn't take the credit but he passes it on to God. He says, oh, no, no, you got to understand, king. What you've just asked, that's impossible for any man, including me. I'm not that good. No one's that good. But there is a God in heaven who is that good. He's the one true God. He's the king of all kings. You king ought to get to know him, by the way. But he's the one who has given this to me. It's not about me. It's about him. Now let me tell you the dream. It's a powerful story. Now, I don't have time to go into the dream. Chapter 2 is a very long chapter. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover that portion in the postscript recording that we'll do here in just a few minutes. And if you have questions, you can text in your questions, and we can talk uh, about those. And then you can watch that. They'll put it up by tonight. And you can watch that as your homework and finish up reading chapter 2 on your own. I I hope you will do that. And while you're at it, read chapter 3 in anticipation of next week. Um, Okay, but before closing, I want you to notice one more thing. There's just one more thing that you have to see from chapter two, and it's this. The first thing you'll notice that Daniel does after he's got the answer, before he's gone and changed anything, the first thing he does is he makes a request, destroy not the magi of Babylon, save them. Stay all the executions. And for Daniel's sake, all the other magi were saved. Not for anything they had done. They were worthless. Just calling on superstitious magical powers and getting them nowhere. But for Daniel's sake, because he made the request, because he intervened personally for his sake, they were saved. And that's significant because as we're going to see in the future chapters, they or their descendants are going to turn on Daniel out of fierce envy. And yet he was the model of grace and said, don't kill him. Don't kill any of them. I've got the answer for you now. I was pondering that and thinking, you know, how similar that is with how it is with our lives, and with one who was the even better Daniel, Jesus, who, like Daniel, was transported from where he lived and where he belonged to a foreign land, even as the heavenly father sent Jesus, his son, into this earth from heaven, this foreign world that he never belonged in, but he came willingly and he lived a life of obedience and faithfulness and sinlessness that you and I couldn't ever live. And then after living that life of perfection, he went to the cross as our substitute and he died the death of suffering and persecution and consequence that you and I all deserve to die for our sins, but he said, I'll take it for you. And he went to the cross and he died in our place. And then on the third day, he was resurrected to life, conquering the grave and signifying that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Likewise, it's a powerful parallel you can't hardly miss when you're reading in Daniel chapter two. But I wonder, 
Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you given your heart and your life to him? Have you just sort of signed your life over to him and said, okay, I'm going to let you take over the show. You're going to be the Lord, the leader of my life. I hope that you have. If you haven't, I hope that you will. Even in the next few moments, we're going to come to the Lord's table and just have some time to commune with him. And my hope and my prayer is that you would open up your heart to him. And even if you have, and many of you have, I hope that you will open up your heart in an even broader way, in an even deeper way, in a way of saying, you know what, I've I've let you access this much of my soul, Lord, but I, I realize now I need to open up all of my soul to you because you really are the king of all kings. My hope and my prayer is that you would do that. So in just a moment, we'll come to the table. And remember, as, as we come, what it is that we're celebrating. We're celebrating this Jesus who came into the earth and lived that perfect life. The night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said to this, his disciples, this is my body. It's broken for you. I want you to take it and eat it in remembrance of what I've done for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And I want you to drink it whenever you come together in worship. And as you do, you'll remember what I've done on the cross for you. And so in just a few moments, the ushers are going to lead you in whichever room that you're in, they'll lead you to come to one of the stations up at the front and you'll find in the baskets a little cracker and you'll take that uh, and you'll dip it into the grape juice and then you can partake. And then also up here at the front and on the sides in every room, we're going to have some prayer partners. You say, what are they there for? They're there for you. Because I just have a sneaking suspicion there's any number of us who we have our own burdens, we have our own problems. You may not be under a death sentence like Daniel and his friends were, but it's big enough. And they want to be here just to pray for you. All you got to do is go to one of them. They should have the red shirts on. Most of them will have a red shirt on to identify them. And you just go towards them and say, it's about this or it's about this. this." Would you pray for me? They'll be happy to pray for you as you call out to the Lord. You say, I, I'd like to pray, but maybe I'd rather do it on my own, and you can do that as well. You just go to one of the steps, and you can kneel there and make that your little place to worship, or you can go back to your chair, and you can, uh, you can worship there. We'll be singing songs and worshiping quietly um, as we do that, but let's just ask the Lord to come and to meet with us now in power, just as he did with Daniel 2,600 years ago. Lord, Thank you for the fascinating story that we're getting to work our way through of this person who had just, well, your life, you were just in his life, Lord. You were guiding him. You were giving him the emotional maturity to be full of grace and truth and wisdom, tact. You gave him spiritual maturity and and that greatest moment of pressure he knew what to do he just went to you forgive us lord for all the times we don't go to you we go to everything else but we don't go to you but today lord we have the chance and we're going to seize that opportunity to come and to commune with you to to have this moment just to worship you and to meet with you in prayer my prayer lord is that every person here today would feel your touch, that your Holy Spirit would come even as we're meeting, that you would work in us, that you'd meet each of us at our point of need, because none of us are at the same point, but all of us have a point where we need you. Won't you move in and meet us there? I pray that you'd do great things, the likes of which we can't even imagine, as we call out and won't you answer? And we're asking all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre and welcome to Postscript. I am here with Pastor Ken Moorline, who just finished part two of the Unshakable series. Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here with us today. Sure. And so in your uh, sermon today, you talked about how Daniel reacted uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, decree to go out and kill all of the wise men. And, um, and so specifically you talked about how we are to respond in times of crisis. And so with Daniel, he responded with tact and wisdom, uh, which got him an audience with the king. Uh, and then he, uh, through prayer was able to actually interpret, God was able to give him the answers to interpret King got Nebuchadnezzar's it. dreams. Yeah. And so, uh, could you elaborate just a little bit on what that dream was what about? What the dream was, yeah, because we didn't have time for it. And it's long. You got you, uh, you to spend uh, about 10 minutes to get through the rest of chapter two. The, the long and the short of it is, though, that the king saw um, this great image, um, this colossus, which is going to tie in very nicely to where we're going next week with the chapter three. But anyhow, he sees this, this huge statue and it's divided into four sections. Uh, at the top, you have the head of gold and uh, the chest and arms were of silver and then the belly and the thighs of brass and then the legs of iron with its feet mi mingled with iron and clay. And so that's what you'll read. And then Daniel begins to explain. Now, here's what it means. And this is the part that, that Nebuchadnezzar was not happy uh, to, to hear. Basically, Daniel says, all right, king, so you and Babylon, you are that head of gold. Congratulations. But then Daniel says, but after you, and it's at that point, you know, the king was like, after me, what? Yeah. There's something coming, yes, there's something coming after you. And so then we move, you know, down the statue. He says, there's a king that's come. Most people believe that was clearly the Medes and the Persians who would conquer the Babylonians after 70 years. And then after them, yet another king and another kingdom, and that would be Alexander the Great and the Greeks uh, that would come in. And then working all the way down, uh, there'll be yet another kingdom that will come and who will conquer the Greeks, of course, that's the Romans. And so now um, the interesting thing about it is though, he's, he's calling attention to the, the feet of clay and it's here that this uh, great stone is going to come and <laughs> obliterate the whole statue. And uh, of course, that's the rock of Christ um, as, um, Peter would say, I jotted down the verse, 1 Peter 2, 4, the, the living stone um, that others rejected. Here was this stone. Daniel was already prophesying. And it would be his kingdom that would stand forever. No other kingdoms are going to stand forever, but his uh, would. So there it is in a nutshell. You can read through um, and imagine in your mind um, Nebuchadnezzar listening to this whole thing when he thought, I'm the greatest, right. and people who think they're the greatest tend to forget there will be something that comes after you. Absolutely. Yeah, God's kingdom still reigns yeah, to this right. day and will right. continue to reign. Right. And so, and in your sermon, you really emphasize prayer yes. and how essential that is um, to respond uh, to crisis with prayer. Right. And so a lot of people have found it very helpful to keep prayer journals. Um, can you speak to the benefits Absolutely. of keeping a prayer journal? I love journaling. And one of the biggest benefits for me is that it keeps my mind from being distracted. Yeah. If I'm not writing or, or now I tend to, to have my devotional times, my quiet times with my laptop and I, uh, can type faster than I can write. Either way, I find that when I'm praying while writing or, or typing, I, I just stay so much more focused on what I'm supposed to be talking to the Lord about. Right. When I try free form prayer, you know, especially if it's early in the morning and, and I'm still a little groggy, you know, the next thing I know I'm thinking about, I need to get the oil changed. 
on the car and I forgot to do this yesterday and I probably better make a dental appointment for the kids or, you know, and, and I'm not praying anymore. Right. And so keeping a journal, I think, is, is particularly uh, helpful for that reason. Secondly, it's particularly uh, helpful and inspiring because you can look back and see, look what God has done. Turn back six months, turn back a year, turn back five years. Look at what, what God has done. And so I have a file cabinet of journals that go back now close to 30 years wow. uh, that I can see what I was wrestling through and where God has come through and provided. Um, and then for the past several years, like I said, I've, I started doing it on my laptop, but I can access that as, as well. One other benefit, but I don't have time to really talk about all of this, and, and that is I, I think that there's benefit in, in actually journaling about our whole devotional time, including the scriptural portion. And that's where I would refer people to the SOAP, SOAP acrostic that I particularly enjoy using in devotions. And I think we have some, a message online that people can access um, about doing devotions. Well, I, the soap across it. absolutely, and I and I imagine too that it helps even in just giving perspective because, like you said, you can go back and you can look uh, back thirty years, absolutely. and you can see that oh man, this prayer took fifteen years for it to be answered, and so I'm being really impatient now, but I've seen God answer prayers yeah. uh, in all kinds of different time frames, sure. and so it can do it can help with our patience yeah. as well. And so speaking of that, absolutely. I know that there are a lot of people who um, they are praying fervently, and they still have not heard an answer from God. And so they're patiently waiting and they're hoping for God to respond. Sure. Do you have any words of advice for those people who are waiting patiently to hear from God? Yeah, absolutely. I remember hearing uh, a sermon years ago and I've preached it um, in which the pastor said, really there's, there's four answers that the Lord always gives. And it's kind of rhymy and, and cutesy, but but there's truth in this, and I think it's helpful. Sometimes he says no, and the door closes, or the funeral happens, and we just have to trust in God's great plan. Okay, this was a no. He's seeing from a higher perspective than we're seeing, and it's not what we wanted, but it is, it's, it's a no, and we'll trust. He's in control, he's good, he's gracious, he's loving. Um, he knows what's best. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's slow, meaning it, not a no, and it may well be a yes, but it's going to be a while because sometimes, especially when you're looking back at old prayers that you've prayed, you say, huh, look at that, because before that could happen, this had to happen, and this person had to do that, and in God's great plan, there was actually something going on. And so that's why he was saying essentially slow. And then yet another one, sometimes God says grow because sometimes the work needs to happen inside of us. It's not that the request is wrong, it's that we're wrong. Right. Something's not right in our spirit and the Lord's saying, I, I'm gonna wait on you till your spirit's right, until you're letting me work inside you uh, satisfactorily, and, and then we'll move on. So sometimes it's grow, and then sometimes it's go. And that's your green light, and that's, that's the answer. So to the person who's um, you know, in this holding pattern, right. not unlike the one that I was in, uh, that I illustrated with 17 years ago, or a handful of people who came up and talked to me after the service that I got to pray with a few of, who are there right now. And, and you know, uh, at the risk of being too cutesy, because I, uh, I certainly don't want to do that or, or minimize, but, but I think there really is, is truth in that. Okay, well, if it's not a no and that door, and the door hasn't closed, but it's not a yes yet, then it's either God's at work doing something, it's a slow, or maybe you, we need to ask God, is there something still more that you want to do inside of me? Is there something that I need to, uh, surrender or some sin I need to confess or something that's not right with me that that I need to to give over to you and uh, but otherwise then we just we have to wait and that's the not fun part just trusting 
and hanging on and saying, okay, Lord, uh, I know that you're good and I know you can do anything. You're the king of all kings. You're the Lord of all time. Um, so I'm trusting and I'll just wait. Absolutely. That's incredibly helpful. And especially if the answer happens to be slow or grow, I'd imagine that's why it's so important to be plugged into community. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, because then you've got people who are with you and they're taking the journey with you. And it's so fortifying when we're walking through a valley to not have to walk through that valley alone. Absolutely. But, uh, well, of course, we always have the Lord, but, but to have some people with some skin on them. Um, that can you can hold hands with and pray with and laugh with and cry with and there's just there's nothing like it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pastor sure. Ken, for uh, being with us today, and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org/postscript.